Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, another episode today of Living Stronger Longer uh, with Rick Chartra, and today I'm joined by Jerome Armstrong. So I recently became aware of Jerome, who has a facility called 18 Minute Fitness. Correct me if I get anything wrong here, Jerome. Sure. Uh, through actually uh, Mark, uh, a, a Facebook group that we both belong to that he recently joined. Help me out here. It's Mark and somebody's Mark and Lori's um, fitness and nutrition group, something like yeah, that. Something Mark and Lori like Stro. Yeah, and uh, it's a good group, by the way. And then uh, Mark came up and, and featured some of your posts and whatnot. And mm -hmm. I started looking, listening to some videos. I was very impressed, as I was telling uh, Jerome just before we got on the recording, with the work he's done, how thorough he is, how rational he is. Uh, and he's done his homework, but also what impressed me was that he doesn't uh, position himself as the authority or anything like that. I like your openness when you say, you know, this is where I'm coming from, because it's something that that's near and dear to my heart. I always say, I don't know the truth. I can tell you what makes the most sense to me at this point in time, based on the information experiences I've had. But I remain open, you know, I, I forgive my language, but I always say, you know, I'm always willing, you know, I reserve the right to be full of, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> the fact is the human body is pretty complicated, right? And uh, who knows what may yet be discovered and, and, and turn what we think we know on its head. So I like, I guess, humility is what the word I'm looking for, even though having done it. And I thought that was very refreshing because I think sometimes in our community, there's a little bit of, you know, this sort of my way or the highway and a, a closed mindedness. And I think um, as soon as you close your mind, you stop learning new things. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I've got it all figured out just yet. <laughs> so anyways, uh, so Jerome, I know that you run a personal training business. I know that you have had other occupations. You've been a fireman in the past and you've had some yep. other occupations. So Maybe uh, uh, give me a quick idea of, of your background, sports, sure. exercise, and how you came to your, you know, what your influences were and how you came to where you're at today. Sure. Thank you for the kind introduction and for uh, setting up this conversation. This means a lot to me. Um, I've subscribed to your videos for a long time and I hold you in high esteem. So the fact that you reached out to me to initiate this conversation um, was really meaningful. So I wanted to start off by thanking you for that. So I was a child of the 80s. I kind of grew up watching Schwarzenegger and Stallone movies. And I remember uh, at a young age, maybe five, six, seven years old, up north at our family's cabin, swinging around a biggest stick I could, pretending I was Conan the Barbarian. That being said, I was a little bit heavier growing up. I um, was kind of made fun of my weight, played high school football. I was an offensive lineman and defensive end. So a little bit more endomorphic. Um, shortly out of high school, I got big into running lost a bunch of fat, but um, didn't really have a lean midsection, didn't really have the kind of muscle that I wanted to have. So while I had lifted weights before then, uh, that was when I made a, a more deliberate effort to try and put some muscle mass on. Fast forward a number of years, um, let's see where I want to pick this story up. Um, I had done a bodybuilding competition in 2009 to get in shape for my wedding. It seemed like a good way to kind of kill two birds with one stone. And uh, a few years later, when my daughter was conceived, um, I emotionally ate and I gained a bunch of weight and I gained something like 80 pounds over the course of my wife's pregnancy. I ballooned up to 297 pounds. And up until that point, wait, wait a was, second. Which, which one of you was pregnant at this point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a sense, we both were right. She was having a baby and I, I was uh, eating fast food way too eating, much. You were eating for three. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to trying to cope with uh, the stress and the concern of of expecting a child, um, so up until that point, I had been exercising or doing resistance training forty five to sixty minutes a day, Monday through Friday. But at two ninety seven, I was a volunteer firefighter. I was in college full time. I was working full time, and I had a baby on the way, so I didn't have that much time to go to the gym. And I knew I had to change, but I I couldn't adhere to the schedule that I had at that time, at least something had to go. And that something ended up being my gym schedule. So um, a couple years later, 
uh, my wife threw me a surprise 30th birthday party. And this was when I was at my heaviest. Um, and I was really, I was flattered by the gesture. It was extremely kind. It was extremely loving. But I remember the look on so many people's faces when they saw me because last they had seen me, I was 200 to 10 and looking pretty in shape and thinking like, my God, like what, what happened to this guy? So, so can and, I ask, sorry to interrupt you for a second. So you were 297 at what height? I'm five foot 11. So I'm just under six feet tall. Okay. And I remember I, just, I wanted everybody to leave. I wanted to just kind of curl up into a corner and ball and, and, and cry. And, and um, at that point, being on the fire department, I knew that the number one killer of firefighters is a heart attack. And if I couldn't get my weight under control and I couldn't take some of this weight off and, and kind of reclaim my health, that I was likely to be another statistic before my daughter was old enough to really know who her dad even was. Um, that ironically led me to listening to Mike Menser. I had previously heard of heavy duty training and had listened to a little bit of Mike's stuff, but kind of brushed it aside, you know, earlier in my weightlifting kind of obsession days. And I turned to heavy duty training as a sort of last resort. It was the only thing that really could fit into my schedule. And when I started training heavy duty, um, I very quickly was able to exceed what I had previously thought were my limits on certain exercises, despite doing far less volume and frequency than I had previously done. And when I saw how good heavy duty training worked, at least in the gym, I blindly accepted what Mike said about diet as well. So I started tracking my calories. I was meticulous in trying to have 60% of my diet as carbs, 25% protein, 15% fat. And I tracked every single thing I ate as accurately as I could. And I gradually reduced calories to the point where I lost, I think, 89 pounds in a year. And, um, from there, uh, I assume that I did a, a pretty decent degree of metabolic damage or, or some kind of long-term damage to my body from that massive amount of weight gain. I was having debilitating migraines almost weekly. I would have headaches daily. And even after I lost a bunch of weight, I noticed that my energy was just terrible and my headaches would be terrible trying to get 60% of my diet coming from carbs. Um, and a friend of mine who had done ketogenic diets in the past for bodybuilding competitions, uh, sent me an article saying something about ketogenic diets and headaches or migraines. And I thought, you know, if this could help with my migraines and help with these headaches, I, I think it merits giving it a shot. So I switched to a ketogenic diet. Um, I was still tracking everything I ate, still trying to um, measure and account for every single calorie. And after trying ketogenic diets for a while and finding that they ameliorated my migraines and it essentially completely resolved all of my headaches as well. Um, I heard Sean Baker and Michaela Peterson on Joe Rogan's podcast talking about a carnivore diet. And at that point, I was really trying to optimize a ketogenic diet and get it as healthy as I could based on the USDA dietary recommendations. So I was having uh, chia seeds, mostly for fiber and for omega-3s, um, olive oil, chicken breast, feta cheese, these giant salads, and, and really trying to hit ketogenic ratios while keeping it as healthy as I could and meet all of my macro and micronutritional needs. And I remember looking at Sean Baker and seeing, here's a guy that's in his fifties setting world records, just eating ribeyes and listening to Michaela Peterson talk about the struggles that she had with a vast array of autoimmune conditions that she through trial and error um, was able to resolve by eating one meal a day, fatty red meat and a decent amount of salt. At that point, I remember thinking, well, it can't really be deficient in anything. If people are able to do it long-term and are able to have the sort of athletic and physical success that, that Baker is having. So I tried a carnivore diet, um, you know, quasi by caprice, but mostly to satisfy an intellectual curiosity. Right. And after doing carnivore for three days, my bedroom then was on the second floor and I went walking down my stairs and I noticed that I didn't have any hip or ankle pain. And sometimes people that live with chronic pain, even if it's not that bad, you, after a while, you kind of forget that you have it. It kind of becomes so remember, kind of a white noise type of thing. Yeah. I remember walking downstairs thinking, God, like my knees, my hips, my ankles feel great. And when I bent over to put my shoes on that day, I was able to bend straight over instead of kind of awkwardly tilting to the side to put my shoes on. And I was thinking like, okay, my ketogenic diet at this point is pretty strict. I'm trying to hit all, you know, all the macros, all the micros get everything I need, but there's something in 
these like six or eight foods that I'm eating that is triggering some degree of inflammation that was able to get better to some extent by doing a carnivore diet. So I've been mostly carnivore since then. I, I do like some indulgences now and then. I'm a big fan of red wine, even though I know I need to cut back. Um, and that's largely led me to where I am today, unless you want to hear the story about how I opened my personal training studio. But um, well, sorry, I, with I, I would like to hear that, but just a quick question. Were you able sure. to isolate one specific or two specific foods that you think were the culprit or just... If do you I, think if I had to speculate in hindsight, based on what I've read about anti-nutrients in plant foods that, you know, have varying degrees of toxicity, I would suspect it was the moderate amount of chia seeds that I was having. Um, that would just be my guess though. I didn't gradually eliminate them. I went right from what I thought was a well-formulated ketogenic diet straight into basically three pounds of beef patties for one meal a day with a shit ton of salt on top. Right. And then to, uh, to kind of bookend my training to get my training up to date is I, I found that I got so strong doing heavy duty um, that I was looking at compound exercises like a bench press, squat, and a deadlift. And I remember thinking as much weight as I'm pushing at this point, the slightest breach of form could cause an injury that could put me in chronic pain for the rest of my life. And I remember thinking at that point, you know, risk reward, are these lifts worth the risk considering I'm probably not going to get a lot of benefit having lifted weights as long as I have. So that yeah, led me to quick, quick question. At that point, sure. had you were, had you run into either through Ellington Darden, which would have been indirectly or, or directly with Ken Hutchins. Had you, were you aware of like moving slowly? Cause I know that Mike Menser might've adhered to the old two seconds up, four seconds down Nautilus thing. So you were lifting those weights. What was your cadence like? I was doing roughly a four, four cadence on my lips okay. at that point, but my, my squats were in the low four hundreds. Um, I did a five fifty deadlift with a, a slower cadence and my bench was never that strong, but I was doing uh two seventy five on the incline. Um, and this is for reps. Yeah. So that was for, you know, anywhere from four to six to five to seven reps at that cadence. Um, and Drew Bay was the name that I had seen before, but he was the first person that I found that I was looking for alternatives within modern high intensity training away from Mike Menser's heavy duty. And after listening to uh, everything I could that Drew advocated uh, that led me towards doing slower repetitions, um, doing a little bit different volume and frequency, um, time static contractions, which I'm a huge proponent of now. And that, that sort of led me to where I am today with training. And what, what got you to decide that you were going to train other people? Now, is the 18-minute fitness, that's, that's your business right now, your full-time gig, yep. or is that a part-time thing? Full-time. So I, there were two primary driving factors that led me to starting this business. Um, I had worked in retail for a long time at uh, Costco, and I was basically in middle management. And as my daughter started to get older, I stepped down to a forklift driver position because the shift was better. And I was working 20 fewer hours a week for only about 10 grand less a year. So I, I had a lot more time with my daughter with my schedule and it seemed to make a lot more sense. Um, but January of last year, I tested positive for COVID. And I had this idea that I, for a long time, had one, been wanting to write a book on exercise and fitness and diet, but from first principles, what we know about human physiology and how the human body actually operates. And over the course of being quarantined with COVID, um, I had five of the best days that I've ever had in my life. It was, it was focused and concentrated, basically sun up to sundown, reading, writing, structuring, and planning my days. And putting everything single-mindedly directed towards that goal of writing that book. And I remember thinking after those five days off, like every day of my life could be like this. If I you know, was bold enough to step out and do my own thing. And then with my daughter getting a little bit older, she was eight at the time. I remember thinking, how the hell can I tell her to chase her dreams? And to do what she wants to do if I'm not willing to take that same risk. So when I got back from my quarantine, I think three days after I got back, I turned in my two weeks notice. Um, I signed a lease here uh, May 1st, which was my 37th birthday. 
at my age, I have to start counting birthdays now and uh, opened June 1st. And it's been slowly growing since then. So June 1st of 2022 is uh, the beginning. All right, cool. And you, where are you located? I'm located in Grafton, Wisconsin. It's a suburb of Milwaukee, about 15, 20 minutes north of Milwaukee. Okay. So anybody in that vicinity should look you up. They just Google 18 minute fitness. Are are, are you accepting new clients? Yes. Um, I largely work by appointment, but I spend a lot of time at my desk in the off chance that there are walk-ins. It's been interesting starting a brick and mortar business, um, especially on the tail end of the pandemic. Right. But um, as you know, a lot of personal training is sort of on the preventative and, and to an extent on the rehabilitative side of things. And it's an extremely important service. Um, so it's been, it's been quite the journey. Okay. Now, when you were training, I know people who have followed the Menser, I'm guessing you did like the real abbreviated routines. Did you go to like, for, at some point it was just basically three exercises, sometimes as seldom as every uh, 10 days and things like that. People have reported, I have not had this experience, that they got stronger and stronger and stronger, but didn't look better. Now, yeah. having said that, I've heard read between the lines of some of the people who've done that, where they also weren't necessarily dieting very strictly during that period of time. And I kind of wonder if, you know, if it was, you know, sort of the chicken or the egg type of thing. Uh, what was your experience as far as changes to your actual physique using, because I'm guessing you're, you're not doing as ultra abbreviated as you were when you were in a mentor camp. Is that fair? It's pretty close now. I might be doing, I might even be doing a little bit less volume and frequency now than when I was following one of Mike's routines. So I've never experimented much with Mike's consolidated routines. And for those who don't know, um, depending on which Mike Menser book you're reading, uh, towards the end of his life, he advocated that perhaps the most advanced training routine a bodybuilder or a strength athlete could follow would be anywhere from two to four total sets, you know, once every seven to 10 days or so. Um, And the reason I never got into the consolidated routines is because they were largely focused on movements like squat, deadlift, and the strength that I was able to build in those movements is kind of what got me away from heavy duty in the first place. But the, I followed Mike's ideal routine in his final book, high intensity training, the Mike Menser way, um, for probably over a year straight. Um, and that was essentially four to five total sets of workout and one workout, maybe every five to seven days. My, my workouts now, um, depending on, who you listen to in the more modern high intensity training camps. Um, my personal preference is for a push pull leg split every, you know, three to four total sets of workout every three to seven days, depending on how I'm feeling and depending on my schedule, I play things a lot more by feel now with my body than I did uh, a few years ago. Back then everything was regimented. I knew I was going to be exercising on certain days, But I think there's something to be said sometimes when you wake up and you just, you feel like you're not fully recovered. You're not mentally all there. And that one or two extra days of recovery isn't going to uh, be detrimental at all. Well, one of the things I found is that one of the challenges when you're training other people or or even for many people training themselves is in a, or if they're going to see a trainer is you have a schedule, a set schedule. And you don't have the luxury of, you know, telling your trainer, listen, I'm not coming in for my Thursday. I'm going to come in on Friday. Well, you know, because I think I need the extra day. Well, your trainer may say, well, I'm booked up on Friday. Yeah. Right. And or the other alternative is to say, instead of twice this week, I'm going to go once this week. But then depending on your situation, your trainer may say, well, then I'm going to have to charge you for the other session or whatever it is. Whereas if you're training yourself, like, for me, as you can see, my facility is in my home. So I have the luxury, not always the time of training if and when I want and right and so I can play with those things. uh, Like you mentioned, if I feel really good one day, I might do an extra couple of sets if I feel down and just take the whole day off type of thing and go from there. But not everybody, of course, has that ability to do that. 
Now, genetics, uh, for people listening, uh, a lot of times when people listen to a strength training, so I'm assuming that somebody could be listening to this who's uninitiated, and genetics plays a major, major role. I think it's, it, there are some people that still, I think, dispute that to some degree, but I think at the end of the day, uh, some people will just go near a weight and get really strong. And recently I had a couple of pictures. I don't know if you saw in my social media, I posted pictures of Gordy Howe as a young man and Bobby Hull as a young man, two farm boys. And, and Gordy Howe came into the NHL at six feet, 205. And if you've seen the picture that I posted, he was with no shirt on. The guy looked like he could have walked onto a bodybuilding stage and apparently the yep. most he ever did was maybe a bit of wrist curls at some point to improve his his backhand or his wrist shot other than that never touched a weight in his life because in his era weightlifting or strength training whatever you want to call it was actively discouraged when athletes it was going to make you slow and make you muscle bound of all things so this guy was like that so and yet you got other people who well at the far end of the bell curve you have some people that actually will get weaker if they get strength training or or you get non-responders and whatnot uh, how would you describe your genetics would you say you're average below sure. average or somewhat above average sure. i would say i'm moderately above average genetics um but even even that claim has to be put into like the, a certain context, you know, right. good genetics for what, if we're talking for bodybuilding and, uh, the ability to have an above average degree of musculature, then yes. Um, but that same genetic predisposition makes me terrible for running marathons would right. probably be detrimental if I was a hunter gatherer and had to carry 20, 30 extra pounds of mass, you know, foraging all day. Right. Um, so that, that nuance matters. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So I, I wish I had access to a cheap DEXA scan or Bod Pod, and maybe it's just my analytical mind. I, I like numbers, and I like precision in measurements. So I had a Bod Pod test a few years ago, and it put my fat-free mass at 188 pounds, at just under six feet tall. So even if I was at zero percent body fat, I would still be overweight, nearing obesity according to the BMI scale. Right. So the way I look at it is there's not a lot of guys that have the genetics to have an appreciable aesthetic physique above 200 pounds. And depending on how lean I am, I'm probably 195 to 210 and looking pretty solid depending on body fat percentage at the time. So relatively above normal. Yeah, well, and and uh, you make a really good point. One of the things I've, I've come to the conclusion is that hypertrophy, significant hypertrophy, is much rarer than, you know, most people appreciate. And, you know, if you've been around, it's going to sound weird, but I'll, I'll explain the context. If you've been around naked men, and what I mean by that is if you play, if you play sports, and you're in the dressing room of a hockey rink, or in my case, I also worked in the mines, right? And then so you get to see people. And of course, if you're playing sports, you're seeing guys that are athletic. You are seeing guys who would probably like to have big muscles, right? This is not your typical, this is the guys who go out and play hockey. Even if it's just pickup hockey, they're relatively active guys. And yet it's, very much the exception rather than the rule to see somebody and, and a lot of these guys if they're playing hockey probably do some form of I would say probably half of them at least 40 50 percent of them might do some form of strength training or at least a few push-ups and things like that and yet it's almost as rare I don't know whether this stat works or not as seeing somebody who's over six feet five Right. It's it's really rare. So I think that managing expectations for people is, is a big, big thing. Right. Because the, yeah. the fitness industry, of course, is selling, you know, that you, too, can look like I mean, most of us can't never mind Arnold Schwarzenegger or these guys. 
even looking like the, the, the fitness model on the magazine cover, you know, the guys that are posing uh, for the Hanes trunks and stuff like that, most people that's not within their, their grasp. Would you agree? Absolutely. So, so you're, you're sorry, did you want to elaborate a little more on that? No, I don't think I could add anything of value on top of what you said there. So now your clientele right now, tell me about the demographics of your current clientele. Sure. Oddly enough, um, and it's I consulted with Jay Vincent before I decided to open a studio. And so he was able to give me a lot of insight and save me a lot of headaches. And I remember him saying that most of your clients that come in are probably going to be 55 plus year old women. Um, when I marketed this studio. And when I came up with the name 18 minute fitness, I originally thought I was going to be selling myself more towards busy professionals who just didn't have a lot of time to exercise. And that was something I felt that I could really relate to. But what I've found, and maybe it's me, maybe it's more of how these types of studios just work, but most of my clients have come to me through referrals. And I found that probably at least 90% of my clients come to me because they have some kind of pre-existing health condition that prevents them from doing conventional exercise, or they've tried to work with other local personal trainers who have sadly told them, sorry, I can't do anything for you. And having spent as much time learning about uh, high intensity training, listening to the Drew Bays, the Ken Hutchins, um, I'm a big believer. If you can move, you, you can exercise there's a way to make it happen and there's a way to make it happen safely within the constraints and the, the capabilities that you have as an individual. Um, so most people I have aren't even trying to look good naked or fit into a certain size dress. Right. Um, most people I have are over the age of 60 and have at least one health condition. I have multiple people with carpal tunnel, rheumatoid arthritis, um, people that need knee replacements, um, issues like that, that are really limiting. And it's, it's frustrating in a sense, because a lot of these people have told me that their former trainers want them to do burpees. And it's like, you can't, you can't take someone that has rheumatoid arthritis or carpal tunnel and 50 or 60 pounds to lose and have them doing these extremely ballistic, high impact movements. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's not only ignorant, but I think it's unethical for a trainer to recommend that. But maybe it's maybe it's just the environment around here. There's a lot of group exercise within personal training around this area. And I get it. If you have 10 people in your class at once, it makes you more money per class than than one client. Well, I, don't, um, I, I doubt it's in your area. I think it's widespread. There's a saying, he who is good with a hammer thinks that everything is a nail. So, you know, burpees or other types of ballistic type movements, whatnot is, is probably what they know and what they learned in their certification. And this is what's good. And, yeah. and, uh, and many of these guys or girls have literally never heard of what we do. Yeah. And of course, and you did uh, some good things about why these types of things are so mainstream and, and why it becomes accepted and why we do it is almost unheard of. And part of it is, of course, uh, you know, uh, reality according to consensus, right? It's like, oh, well, everybody does it this way. So yep. that must be the way you do it. But, you know, I look at, uh, for example, I've seen, you know, if you, if you have an Apple watch or even I have a Fitbit, and every now and then, I, the only reason I have a Fitbit, I don't care about how many steps I get. I like to track my sleep though. And, sure. and, um, but there's, there's, there's uh, workouts that they suggest on your app, on your phone. And, you know, of course the people showing their workouts are always fitness models. They all look like fitness models and they're doing things that are from a skill point of view, most of it I wouldn't be able to do. Uh, and I, I, or if I did it, I did it awkwardly, which means I'm also doing it unsafely. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, but that's, that's what uh, is the mainstream right now. But interestingly, uh, once you get people in, so your clients, they're not going to be doing that. So they're not even going to attempt it. They're going to look at that right. 
if they watch see it at all, they're going to go look at that and say, I can't do that. I couldn't do that if my life depended on it. Right. Yeah. And it's tough in a sense too, because people will look at that and the assumption is that's what they have to do to look like that in the first place. And you're in, and I've seen your pictures on Facebook, you're in amazing shape, you know, for any age, you're in better shape than most 20 and 30 year olds walking around. And that doesn't take, you know, 45 to 60 minutes a day on the elliptical or burpees or kettlebell swings or shaking battle ropes. And I don't know how long you've been um, instructing exercise, but you do this long enough, you see the same trends come and go, but people are able to build you know, an aesthetic physique and aesthetics is maybe one of the easiest things to train for. Um, it, it requires a lot less work than a lot of specific athletic type movements. Um, so yeah, I get a little, I get a little spicy with it. I didn't want to draw inference based on, you know, training, uh, approaches as a whole, based on my limited scope in this area. But I, I am inclined to believe what I see here and, and the trends that I see online are probably indicative of the attitude as a whole. Right. Well, and, and it's interesting. I, I've been, you know, back in the day, they had aerobic dancing, right? Now they call it Zumba. Yeah. Uh, but they had aerobic dancing and then they had low impact aerobics, which, you know, by definition, why did they bother with low impact aerobics? Well, obviously, because the other ones were creating issues. So they had to come up with a uh, one that was not as bad and somehow or other that's come and gone for the most part or been renamed Zumba and then they came up with CrossFit where CrossFit uh, the, uh, credit where credit is due CrossFit has definitely discovered intensity uh, but the whole low impact thing has gone completely out the window let's do some yeah. kip, kip pull ups and things like that and power cleans and and, when, and actually, I just recently was talking, there's a 16 year old who's my neighbor, who is uh, very fitness oriented and, you know, would like to play sports and things like that. And he's 16 years old. And I asked him, you know, what are they getting you to do at school? They're getting them to do power cleans. Yeah. Right. 16 year old kids doing power cleans in, sc in school. And, you know, what could go wrong? Uh, <laughs> So question for you, are you still using the squat and the deadlift and uh, bench presses with barbells or are you using other tools these days? I currently don't have, nor do I use any barbell movements here in my studio with myself or clients. I do have dumbbells and I have maybe eight or so exercise machines and then an adjustable bench to where I can do uh, lumbar extension or sorry, torso extension. Um, and you get kind of creative with that. Um, so much of what I do is, is tailored around kind of the big five exercises. And then I'll use exercise bands or, um, yoga blocks, a toe strap for isometrics as necessary. Um, so I'm kind of built around the basic compound pushing and pulling movements. And then I have free weights and some of the other, uh, peripheral, um, workout paraphernalia to address some of those other issues. And I think for most people, that's probably enough. Um, my aversion to the basic compound lifts, I think they can be done safely. Um, I think they can be done within high intensity training protocol to elicit the benefits of exercise in a very safe and very productive way. Um, my own personal preference is I just don't want the free space in my studio for a power rack when I think I can get the same degree of results um, using the equipment that I have. There was a certain uh, the financial impetus to pick some of the pieces of equipment that I had. I had originally wanted first or second generation Nautilus or MedEx equipment. Um, but as you know, especially MedEx equipment gets very expensive very quickly. Mm -hmm. So as the business grows, I would like to pick up a MedEx uh, exercise lumbar machine but at least at the moment, those are like $4,500. So in the moment, um, if I can just have somebody doing very smooth, controlled, um, any kind of like hip hinging movement, like a stiff legged deadlift, um, I have some people that I'll do isometric lumbar extension with. Um, that's good enough for now. But um, at the moment, no, I don't do any, I don't do any barbell work myself. Um, 
to me, a, a good quality converging chest press um, or dumbbells or even uh, the time static contraction, I think is every bit as effective. Well, the reason I asked about uh, squats, particularly squats and deadlifts, and I know that Drew Bay and Drew Bay and I have uh, uh, agreed for much of the time and we've butted heads once or twice. And, uh, and one of the things that I uh, respectfully but disagree with, he feels that squats and deadlifts can be done safely. Mm -hmm. And I think I guess if you just take that that sentence in itself can be done safely, I couldn't disagree. I do think though, that it's a matter of yeah, but you only have to get it wrong once. Yeah. And, and you can injure yourself. I'm also not convinced uh, that over time, the compression of the spine, which is inherent in those two movements. And, yep. and you did a really good analogy about a frayed rope, where you talked about, you know, in a, a fireman and whatnot, and that over time, you know, when you do finally hurt yourself doing a deadlift or maybe just picking up a t-shirt or whatnot, it may or may not be uh, what you did that day, but just actually maybe could you share a little bit about what you meant by subacute injuries and how sure. you can get away with stuff. I thought that was a really great analogy. Sure. So any time you were doing any degree of resistance training, you are imposing shearing forces on your muscles and on your joints. And shearing force is essentially force happening in multiple directions at once. Right. And that happens because of Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So um, the analogy that I used in one of my more recent presentations was talking about when I was on the fire department, I was also on the county's elevated rescue team in case we had to climb up something or rappel up or repair, rappel down. And you learn very quickly that different types of rope have different tensile strength. And the tensile strength is the amount of force that something can take in opposite directions before it snaps. But the working load limit is one tenth or one fifteenth the amount of that tensile strength. And this is all analogous to your connective tissue in your body. So anytime you lift weights, you are imposing some degree of shearing forces that will likely cause at least some slight degree of injury or uh, what we call subacute trauma to that connective tissue. Now, if you're exercising at a volume and frequency that your body can recover from, your body will repair that damage and it will hopefully make you a little bit stronger as a result. That's called Wolf's Law of Resistance. But if you're not allowing enough time to recover, or if you're doing too much volume or too much frequency, you may not necessarily feel it at the time, but those subacute injuries will accumulate to the point where over time it could potentially snap. So the analogy that I used in the video was if you take a piece of rope and you rub it on a firm surface, the corner of a table, if you tie a rope around a tree and you're pulling on this rope back and forth, the rope will be fine at first when you continue to pull on it. And then slowly it'll start to fray. And if you have enough load on this rope, it'll fray a little bit more. It'll fray a little bit more. It'll still look pretty decent. And then suddenly it'll just snap. Um, it looks, you can see it kind of going and then all of a sudden it's just gone. Bam. And I tend to think that's what happens a lot of time with people who go into the gym or especially in like professional sports will uh, tear a tendon in their knee or pull their hamstring. It's not necessarily what they did in that moment that caused that issue. It's months, weeks, or possibly even years of subacute trauma that has built up on that particular joint. Another point that you made in that video that I, I hadn't considered before is you said tendons, ligaments, and other connective tissue don't heal as quickly as muscle because they have less blood flow. So your muscles yeah. may be recovered and getting stronger, but some of these connective tissues may not be as recovered. And of course, you won't know, perhaps till much later. Yeah. And something like muscle protein synthesis goes back to baseline levels, something like 48 to 72 hours after we work out. Now we can still have elevated markers of inflammation after our workouts for significantly longer than that. But, um, we have such a, a muscle focused mindset when it comes to exercise. And really, I think in a lot of ways, we, we probably should be thinking joints first because they're, they're more susceptible to injury and long-term damage. 
Yeah, it, well, and that's uh, a good point. Turnarounds, proper turnarounds, and, and doing all these. Because basically, um, what you're saying is akin to sort of, I think, uh, Arthur Jones or Ken Hutchins saying, every exercise to some degree is a negative. All, well, technically, all movement, all activity to some degree is a negative. But it's kind of like there's a hormetic effect because, of course, yeah. the, the opposite is if you did absolutely nothing, if you were in a coma or you were bedridden because of illness or an accident, then you would quickly deteriorate. But there's a negative to any activity or whatnot or any like there's forces. You said when you're lifting weights, but there's forces just when you move around. But your body is able to deal with it and absorb it and adapt to it to a point. Right. Yeah. So, um, so now, what do you think of what I do here? I'd like to get your opinion is because sure. I can, I often work out every day, but I only do one or two sets. I think in my mind, as long as my total sets per week, I'm going to say less than 15, but I've been tracking it lately. Usually it's less than 10. And sometimes as little as seven. Do you think it's kind of like I'm splitting hairs here and six of one half dozen of the other doesn't really matter? Or do you think, because part of me is going uh, that repeatedly, you know, creating a, a stimulus more often may have some benefits of its own as long as you don't overdo it. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to doing a full body work. And of course, for most people, that's not practical. You're not going to go into the gym, do one or two sets and leave because I'm working out at home. I can do like today. I did one set of rows, right? Mm -hmm. And I had a busy day. So that's all I'm going to do. Uh, yesterday, I did two sets, right? Any speculation as to whether that's negative, positive, or just almost irrelevant at the end of the day. Yeah, I would, I would imagine it's probably, I would say it's probably, in my opinion, largely irrelevant, but there is something to be gained from the mental and emotional benefits of, of pushing yourself hard on a, on a somewhat frequent basis. So I did the same thing for a while. I, I would go into the gym and do only one to two sets, but I was going every single day. And I eventually just gave that up because I had to drive to the gym to make right. it happen. Um, I, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Like I, I like pushing sets right. hard and I, I like the feeling that accompanies that. So, um, if you enjoy doing that and if you're still seeing some degree of progress or uh, it certainly it doesn't appear to be detrimental at all, I would keep doing it. Yeah. And that's one of the things, um, what you said, you know, recent, I don't know if you listened to Drew Bay's recent video, what I learned from 30 years in the strength business. Have you listened to it? I think I listened to about half of it. So, you know, and it, he made some really good points. I'd have to say that I probably agree with 90% of what it is. I think some things lack context. Uh, yeah. But one of the things he said, you know, like you don't go to the dentist to for enjoyment and your exercise isn't for enjoyment. You're going there for the result, not for the process. But based on what you just said, um, there are, I think people enjoy working out. Yep. Right. And I don't think that's, I find that sometimes it's a little too black and white type of thing that, that you shouldn't enjoy working out. And I, I, what I tell my clients is at first you find this really hard, but after a while, you're going to find a sense of exhilaration from pushing mm -hmm. yourself to your limits. It's going to feel good. And I think it's actually, you call it bodybuilding, but I think there's a lot of character building that is built by people routinely pushing themselves to their limits. And they come to enjoy uh, not just the result, but the process. Yep. Um, and, anything to add? No, I was just thinking that. Um, similarly, I agree with a lot of what Drew Bay has to say, but I, you reminded me of... Um, I know a girl that came in here for a couple of trial workouts and one, she was gassed after three sets, despite doing CrossFit four nights a week. Um, but she confided in me that 
she understands the methodology here, but she goes to CrossFit because of the community and she's right. largely been unhappy with the results that it's given her, but her going to CrossFit four or five nights a week keeps her out of the bar and keeps her from drinking heavily on a frequent basis. Right. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I drew as some of the best information online when it comes to exercise. Um, but I, I'm with you. There are a couple things that he says that I feel need a, a yeah, but caveat to them. Um, because there are people that will benefit from more frequent exercise and, and having some kind of structured discipline. Um, or some people may even benefit from pushing that set as hard as they can, uh, even right. though there seems to be some pushback to some of those set extenders and intensifiers. Well, you know, interestingly, recently I did a podcast with Richard Wolf, and I also have done one with Logan Hurley, and I apologize, Logan, if I'm mispronouncing your name, of Discover Strength. Sure. And, and a couple of things, like Richard Wolf said to me, he used to do just a big five or six and didn't do set extenders and didn't do anything. And when he started to do that, um, the clients loved it. Right. And I remember also discover strength thinking, you know, don't just do the big five, throw in some variety, throw in some forced reps, throw in some breakdowns, throw in stuff like that, because people will get tired of just doing the big five and, mm -hmm. and type of thing. And Drew kind of says, well, none of those things work. None of those things matter. Different rep schemes and whatnot are a waste of time, blah, 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 and whatnot. And I'm, I'm thinking, because his statement is, and maybe Drew will listen to this, and of course he's free to comment back. His statement, I think, is is lacks some context. He said, because he says, well, nothing is going to give you more than what your genetics will allow. Well, obviously that that statement is irrefutable. Nothing will give you more right. than your genetics uh, will allow. But if it keeps you coming back. And you know, you saw and you commented on one that I did about how intense is intense yep. enough, or should you do more? But interestingly, one of my clients who went to see uh, Blair Wilson was the person I talked to, and, and he did not because he was unhappy with me, but Blair is like five minutes from his house. He can walk down the street <laughs> and, and, and it makes sense because I'm like a 35 minute drive. And I wished him well, and I said, Blair's a great trainer, and he should go. But feedback that he got was that Blair pushed him harder than I did, and, 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 and he felt he got a better workout. Well, this particular gentleman is 70. I question whether at 70 you're going to get better results pushing harder. I might even possibly think, you because know, you can only benefit from the workouts you can recover from. But there's yep. no question that clients like the feeling that they're that you know they've been spent after a workout that the workout really did that and i'm thinking why not if it keeps people interested if it keeps people motivated right yeah and that video of yours and if people listen to this and haven't watched that video they need to go back and listen to that because that's one of my favorite videos that anybody has ever put out online with respect to intensity of exercise and I, I like that in that video, you were probably asking more questions than answering them. And you raised a lot of points that made me think. Um, so I have multiple clients that are over the age of 80. And when you raise the question, you know, should I be pushing possibly some of these elderly people to the point where they're going to struggle to walk? And then, you know, if they get out the door and collapse, yeah. you know, was it a good thing that I pushed them that hard? That's a, that's a valid question. Um, and that's one that's given me a lot of pause and I, I still don't think I could formulate a proper response to that. Um, and I'm deeply grateful for people that truly make me think. Um, so hands down, that is one of my, my favorite videos online with respect to exercise, but specifically intensity. Um, so but, I, yeah. and, I, and I had a conversation when you are dealing with an elderly, elderly people slips and falls are you know one of their biggest hazards and they're coming to you to get stronger to avoid slips and falls so yeah. they're, if they're leaving your gym with rubber legs that you know maybe you got a little slope in your driveway or something <laughs> on the way down because i remember going leaving a, a workout one time 
uh, Brian Johnson. Do you know Brian Johnson? J reps yep. and all that stuff. And Brian, yep. I mean, he gave me this. And I, I had a hard time walking down his driveway. And that's got to be 20 years ago. So that was quite a bit younger. Type of thing. <laughs> and it was an amazing workout. But I kind of question because, you know, we sometimes in the hit community will criticize people who do too much volume and too much frequency. But sometimes might we be guilty of doing too much intensity? And you know, you hear these stories about, you know, lying on the floor for half an hour after your workout or falling asleep or, you know, puking and things like that. And I think some of that was, you know, Arthur Jones marketing uh, yeah. type of thing. Because I think if you're being progressive, as long as there's improvements along the way, especially if you're dealing with people who are 60, 70, 80, because let's face it, they're supposed to be going the other way. So if they're just getting a little stronger all the time, then mission accomplished, right? Yep. And uh, I mean, that's the other thing too, is if you're training an athlete, and let's say that you're training a power lifter. So obviously notwithstanding, he's gonna have to practice the lifts and whatnot, but let's say he's doing all the right. skill stuff on his own for my thought experiment here. But your job is to get him as strong as he can so that he can use that strength and then practice his skills and whatnot. But he's got to meet in July 17th, on July 17th. Then your goal at that point is to be as effective as you can in order to get him to the best chance of winning his competition that day. But if you're training me and all I want to do is make sure I can play with my granddaughter and and not in, use a walker and have to go into a long term care facility down the road, then then it doesn't matter, in my opinion, as long as you're as long as I'm progressing. Yeah. And that's a that's a big reason why I got away from full body uh I'm gonna say super slow, but I know super slow is a Ken Hutchins brainchild, um, slower rep, not Mike Metzer heavy duty, but I got away from doing full body, high intensity training workouts because I found that for the next three or four days, it just seemed like such a detriment. I was so tired for the next couple of days. It, it felt like it took away so much out of my life and out of my schedule that in splitting to a push pull leg split and further reducing the volume and frequency a, a bit, I, I can still be active and run around with my daughter. Right. Right. Um, so like the thing about Drew Bay and I don't, I'm not poo-pooing on him at all. Like the guy is incredibly smart. I agree with 99 plus percent of everything, uh, he says, but I think my biggest point of disagreement with, um, you're right. There's a lot of black and white thinking in the high intensity training camp is there are other, you know, tangential factors that should probably be taken into account. Um, personal preference, quality of life issues, stuff like that. It, it's not so black and white that we can just look at it and say, it's like brushing your teeth. You do it at prescribed intervals and this is how you do it. Right. Um, yeah. And I, same way. And I have, I have a mom of four with rheumatoid arthritis that came to me because she couldn't play with her kids. Right. So should I put her on the leg press until she pukes? No, <laughs> probably not. I could, but I'd be, I'd, I'd be doing more long-term harm than good. I think at least mentally and emotionally, if I was doing that. Well, I think to, um, Placebo and nocebo. I, I just learned the word nocebo. Uh, you're familiar with that? So placebo yeah. is where, where nocebo is where you uh, missed, maybe mistakenly is not even the right choice of words, that you feel something is detrimental to you and it's a quote unquote sugar pill. Uh, but, you know, in fairness, you know, we know that demonstrating strength and building strength are not always the same thing or almost are almost never the same thing. But yet other trainers, I've speculated on this, when they focus on performance to track progress, when all of a sudden they say, hey, look, you can do more burpees in a minute than you were able to do before, that's very motivational for their clients. Yeah. Whereas if you're just doing uh, sets and you're just doing and say, oh, guess what? You did like 11 seconds more time under load than you did the last time. And, and you know, you added a quarter pound, things like that. Whereas if they, when they see their performance improve, there's a kind of a self reinforcing thing that yep. comes into play with that. And, and one of the things um, 
Some people have criticized Ellington Darden. I'm guessing you've read Ellington Darden's book. A couple of his books, yeah. So for writing the same book 50 times, right? Mm -hmm. With some other little pattern or different things. But, you know, Arthur Jones and Ellington Darden said, don't underestimate the benefit of somebody believing in the program that they're in, mm. believing in it. And sometimes if, you know, I've speculated, of course, I would be, uh, you know, Ellington Darden probably wouldn't want me to say this out loud, but I'm wondering if some, <laughs> of, his, some of his methods, if somebody says, oh, yeah, this is great. I'm going to lift in 10 and do 30 and 30 second do 10. And, and this is a magic formula to get better gains. And that keeps people motivated and really going for it. It might actually give them better gains. You yeah. know what I mean? I, like I actually think that when people go to a public gym and there's lots of big guys around and they believe more because they see those guys around them that are big, I think I, I, I'm really reserving the right to be full of it on this one, but it would not shock me at all that that is very helpful in them achieving their own results by seeing other people do it, right? Yeah, yep, I would agree. I mean, I, I was in sales for 30 years in insurance sales. And one thing I realized is if there were, it, your best salesman set the standard for, for your branch. Hmm. And if you hired somebody and he was an, and he was three times as good as that time, because your best guy, everybody would look at him and say, well, that's pretty much that's the standard. But if you hired somebody and he did three times better, all of a sudden it was like, oh, this guy's no big deal. I need to do this. And I think that's part <laughs> of it. So I think that, that, you know, going back to Drew, I think there's these psychological things that come into play that truly, I mean, at the end of the day, yes, uh, if, you know, to play the devil's advocate and say, Drew, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Nothing's going to go past your genetics. That's true. But right. does anybody ever reach their genetic potential? No, I, I think Mike Mentzer had a quote, something like to reach your genetic potential, you would literally have to diet and train perfectly. Um, and maybe it's just my my inner bodybuilding mindset and, and you've competed. The amount of time and effort and attention and energy that we put sometimes in trying to get that last fraction of a percent, you know, we should maybe really question if if our return on investment right in that regard if i think if there's one thing modern hit really need two things that modern hit really needs to work on one is is community within our clients because hit will always be niche but we ought to be paying attention to what crossfit is doing and what some of these other gyms are doing to build environments right. and create a community of people that are all of the same mindset and the same goals and yeah, I think um, I think the other is well. Aside from how we communicate our message, in some instances, is showing progress to clients. So I keep track of all my clients' records on paper, but I also do it digitally. And then usually a week or two before they're due for, you know, renewing or, or paying for another package or training sessions, I'll print these line graphs showing their progress over time. Because at least then I have something tangible that I can give them. Right. Let's say, okay, compared to 10 weeks ago, these are your numbers and look at how this line has improved. This is your strength since you came to me. Um, that makes <laughs> that makes getting that next 12 or 24 sessions a lot easier. But it's it's hard when people come in because the weights always feel heavy. You right, know, exactly. It's always a challenge. And they don't always see to the same extent that we do how much progress they might actually be making. Um, so that's another thing I think we have to think on is, is how can we better get our clients to understand some of the benefits of what they're doing here when they come to exercise with us? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I, I have a few clients that have made the comment, I don't feel like I'm getting it stronger because it's, it's, it, it feels hard. It's harder. And I, and I have to say, well, yeah, it's harder because I keep increasing the weight. <laughs> yeah. Know? So it's never going to get easy, but then that their, their perception is they always feel like they're struggling, right? Yeah, it's it's a hard, and it, if you even if you just tell them you're up five or ten pounds, okay, that that doesn't really mean anything, right? So I, I don't know. I'm thinking about 
I'm thinking I'm going to get a tablet at home that I'm not using, an iPad, and just sync it up to Google uh, Slides or um, Google Sheets, whatever, so that I can just show them their graph whenever I need to. So I just have that with me, you know, maybe on the backside of my clipboard as I'm recording their workout. Um, because I feel like we need some kind of better positive feedback in that in that moment. Have you had success in helping clients to uh, uh, take on and adhere to dieting, nutrition after they leave you? Yeah. I've found that to be one of the biggest challenges is, is getting people to, you know, they're kind of like, I'm coming here, I want to get strong and whatnot, because as far as I'm concerned, dieting, well, let's face it, dieting, counting your, your, your calories and watching what you eat and stuff like that is a pain in the butt. Yep. Let's call a spade a spade. It's a pain in the butt. And, and most people will do it for a while, but there's a reason that very few people do it long term. Have you had any yeah. success with that? I have given clients general recommendations in terms of diet, and I am very quick to stress how important diet actually is. But but the more people I've talked about diet, and I've done a lot more diet consultations and, and coaching people in the past, the more I realize that a lot of what you're really trying to coach when you're helping someone with their diet is their certainty in a plan. You know, how confident are they in that approach? And then their ability to consistently adhere to it. Because every diet works. I mean, you you could I've had calorie or sorry, I've had clients that I just recommend that they count calories. I have some people that don't want to count anything and are very happy dropping out all carbs. Some clients want to do things very differently. Um, it's so highly individualized based on people's preferences and in a lot of ways what they think will work. So a lot of times if I, if I start people with diet, I usually start by asking, well, what have you done in the past that's worked? Because if somebody's asking about diet, they've probably gone on multiple diets before and they've right. probably seen varying degrees of success with a wide assortment of approaches. So my first usual piece of information is what have you done before that's worked in the past? Start with doing that. Just do that for right now, whatever that is. And we will fine tune that, you know, the next time we talk or you can reach out and call and text me and we can, we can always raise things to a higher level. We can always improve our standards, but for right now, you just need to take action. And so it's one reason I, I, I probably should offer some kind of diet plan, nutritional coaching uh, as a separate service for clients. But at least right now, I try and keep things just very focused on the workouts and what I can actually do in gym when I can directly control this environment. Well, I know, and I know a lot of people, and the, the thing I would, at the very least, what I'd like to be able to get particularly, well, almost specifically my older clientele is to eat more protein. Yes. Because the more I read, uh, the more protein is important to everybody. And the other thing is I'm finding as I talk to people that I thought everybody ate a lot more because I do even before I even thought of it. I just like meat uh, and other protein sources, mostly meat, actually. But a lot of people, when I ask them little questions like, what would you have for breakfast? Well, I had a bowl of cereal. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm going to have and the lady left this morning. She's going to have an egg with a toast. Well, I mean, an egg's a good, better choice than the bowl of cereal, but one egg <laughs> is about nine grams of protein. Right. Yeah. And, and this lady is 70. Uh, so her protein requirements are significantly higher. And I think, you know, earlier I talked about hypertrophy and it being rare, but I think with older people, if they want to reverse sarcopenia and want to put on muscle, strength training is good. But so first of all, uh, they need more protein because they're older. But if they're strength training, they need even more because they're strength training. Right? Yeah. If I could just get people to get their heads around that, I, I'm, I was frankly surprised when I talked to people and asked them, what are you having for lunch? What do you eat? things like that, just give me a little idea of what you're eating, that most people aren't consuming nearly enough protein. So, yeah. you know, if I could just start with that, because uh, I really think, and I don't think, 
you know, there's different schools of thought and, and debate about how much protein is enough. But whatever that number is, if you're below it, you're going to have problems. Yep. If you're above it or significantly above it, it's not going to create magic. Once you're there, whatever, wherever there is, going way above it isn't going to create magic. But being below it, I think is not just to your results, but actually detrimental to your health. Yeah. And I'm, I, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say I have, I have multiple clients that live in uh, independent senior living and those people at those centers will prepare meals uh, concordant with certain nutritional guidelines. But a lot of times people aren't even eating those meals and those meals can be relatively low in protein anyways. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I'm with you with protein too little is definitely a thing and too much protein in most cases, it isn't really a thing. Well, first of all, it would be like, once you get there, that's a pretty easy one to fix, but most people are nowhere near. Right. However, too much would be type of thing. Um, but anyways, that's, that's the one thing. I think that if you position yourself, you or I, as a diet person, and I also think if you charge a significant price for your nutritional counseling, then people are the people who, if somebody comes to you because they've seen your marketing for nutrition and your prices, then what you're getting is you're getting somebody who's coming to you motivated. Yeah. Because they've sought you out as opposed to the person who sought you out for strength training. And now you start to suggest something else. It's kind of like, okay, well, that's kind of a good idea, but that's not really why I came here. Whereas if you get somebody who's seen your marketing and has said, you know, I'm going to help you get healthy and lose 30 pounds and keep it off and stuff like that. And for my program, you're going to pay a hundred bucks a week yeah, over and above. Then if that person walks through your door, you got a motivated person. And, and one of the things that I tell people and I guess I'm being a terrible salesman or I'm just being honest. I say, <laughs> I say, listen, understand something. If, if fat loss is your goal, understand that the odds of losing it and maintaining that loss over time are heavily stacked against you. Uh, Ellington Darden wrote in one of his writings, I don't know if it was in a book or an article, he claimed to have the best success of anybody and challenged anybody to have the best, the better success than him. And of course, it was the same Mike Menser stuff, you know, Ellington Darden stuff, 60%, yep. right? And all that, he's gone a little higher with the protein, whatnot. But the interesting thing about that was his success rate for people over five years who had lost and kept the weight the one that he held up to say nobody can beat this was 17 percent 17 percent protein no 17 percent of people who had kept the oh. weight after five okay years, which gotcha. means that the let, let's take him at his word and let's say that's the very best results out there 83 percent of the people gained back the weight at the end of five years and that's the gotcha. best yeah. You know, and statistically, the numbers are even worse than that. So that's why I tell people, yeah. <laughs> if, you start, if you're starting this, understand this is a lifelong thing. It's not about losing weight so you can go to the beach this summer. It's it's about, you know, losing it. You know, my father was an Alcoholics Anonymous. He used to say, quitting is easy. He says, not starting over. That's the hard part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And I think diet is like that, too. So, you know, and I... I, I've read some things where people say it's almost impossible to lose weight and, and maintain it off once you get it. And this was from a scientific study it said, so you're better off. Just, just don't gain it in the first place, which is yeah. not very helpful if you're already pounds <laughs> overweight, right? Exactly. We're going to have to have a watch party sometime where we watch uh Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Cause you just reminded oh, yeah, me I've of Alec list. Baldwin, get them to sign on the line that is dotted. <laughs> but I apologize to cut this short. It's it's my time. I got to let you go here. No, no, I, I appreciate it. And a uh, uh, good chat and kind of conversational. Hopefully I didn't dominate too much. I'm long with Not at all. But, uh, you're, you're being nice. I'm sure you had that thought. 
Um, I would, I'd absolutely love to do this again. If you'd ever have me, uh, it's always, yeah. it's always great. To, there's so few hit people, you know, online that are at least relatively active that it's a, it's a true joy whenever I can speak with someone with a, a similar mutuality of values. Well, I will send you the recording and get you to give me whatever links we can add to it to make sure that people know where to find you and whatnot. And I'll let you get, go and pick up your daughter. Excellent. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome, sir. Bye for now. Take care.